931, excuse me. Let's go ahead and call the meeting to order. Um, <clears throat> Madam Clerk, are we good, by the way? Are we, are we on? Are we? All right, I just want to make sure that we're online and everything. So, All right, so uh, call the meeting to order, Madam Clerk. Approve the minutes of regular meeting of July 18th, 2023. So every member had a chance to review the minutes, and if so, is there any discussion? <clears throat> If there is no discussion, then I'll make a motion to accept the minutes as presented. Is there a second? Second. Motion has been made and seconded. All in favor of accepting the minutes, uh, please respond by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. The ayes have it. The ayes do indeed have it. Madam Clerk. Consent agenda items one through 27. Is there any discussion on the consent agenda? <coughs> Just real quick here. Chair, recognize Vice Mayor Ho Heisel for a real quick discussion. <laughs> um, could we pull item uh, 4A, please, just for discussion? Item 4A is pulled and will be discussed uh, following this item. Is there further items to be pulled? If not, I'll make a motion to accept the consent agenda as presented, uh, items 1 through 27, with the exception of item 4A. Is there a second? Second. Motion has been made in the second by Vice Mayor Hoheisel. All in favor of said motion, please respond by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. The ayes have it. The ayes do indeed have it. Chair recognizes Vice Mayor Hoheisel for discussion on item 4A. Yes, I, I was just wondering, um, we put 15,000, it looks like, into this plan for um, additional rights for people who have disabilities. Um, are we coming up short in this? Because it says after the money runs out and then they're responsible for um, a rate of $3.40 for one way trip travel. So um, do we, are we running up short? Is this something we can shore up so that way they aren't impacted? So it sounds like uh, the discussion, uh, we'll, we'll turn it over to the manager, but it sounds like what happens when the money runs out, how do, how do we ensure that folks who need paratransit, continue that service. So I um, guess we'll just I'm not, ask the, the yeah. city manager if there's a staff person or someone that could help talk us through this. Mayor, I'm not sure if I have anybody from transit. This is a contract that we have with Sedgwick County Development Disability Organization. So if there's a shortfall, they're the ones that um, administer the program. We simply provide the transit at, at their request and on our con with the contract. So I, I, I don't know. Okay, if, if I could um, just maybe in the future or sometime here soon get just what the, the gap is between what they provide and um, what the final number is and see if maybe that's something we'd be interested in, in helping to fill. Further discussion. All right, if there's no further discussion, then I will recognize the vice mayor uh, for uh, a motion on, on this item. Thank you, Mayor. I move that we approve the agreement and authorize the necessary signatures. I'll second that motion. So this is for item 4A on the consent agenda uh, is a motion uh, to uh, accept the recommended action and a second. All in favor of said motion, please respond by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. The ayes have it. The ayes do indeed have it. Madam Clerk. Board of Bids and Contracts dated July 24th, 2023. Morning. Good morning, Mayor and City Council, Josh Lauber, Department of Finance. The July 24th, 2023 Board of Bids recommendations are as follows. For engineering, we have the Stryker Sports Phase 9B press box expansion for Harmon Huffman Construction Group Incorporated in the amount of $333,300. We have the Outsource Payment Preservation Program CIP Concrete Street Repairs Phase 3 for PPJ Construction Incorporated in the amount of $488,000. We have for purchasing the solidification and disposal of non-hazard liquid waste for Ready Industries Incorporated in the amount of $363,944. Uh, the acoustical panel installation will be deferred July 31st. We have the one-ton utility body pickup truck for Davis Moore Automotive Incorporated for $78,235. Uh, 
We have the two 2023 Chevrolet Blazers for Don Hatton Chevrolet in the amount of $73,900. This is how to become a vendor with the city of Wichita. These are our current open requests for proposals out on the street. And I'd recommend to approve the bid boards recommended and try to answer any questions. All right, questions for, for staff. See none, is there any discussion on this item? If there's no discussion, then I'll make the motion to accept staff's recommended action to receive and file the report, approve the contracts, and authorize the necessary signatures. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Vice Mayor Hoheisel. All in favor of said motion, please respond by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. The ayes have it. The ayes do indeed have it. Madam Clerk. Council member appointments and comments. Let's start off with appointments. Are there appointments? I will be appointing uh, Brock Booker uh, to the Transit Board. Further appointments? No further appointments. So I'll make a motion to accept the appointment of Brock Booker to the Transit Board. Is there a second? Second. Motion has been seconded by Vice Mayor Holheisel. All in favor of said motion, please respond by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. The ayes have it. The ayes do have it. Let's go ahead and uh, switch it into comments <coughs> or discussion for the good of the group. Any announcements? Let's see, yes. Remind everybody that this weekend is Convoy of Hope, and also the District 6 Coffee uh, will be volunteering um, at Convoy of Hope at Evergreen. So, excellent. It's Convoy of Hope at Evergreen. So, if you are There's so different locations, the, but we're also going to coincide our District 6 Coffee to volunteer. So, if you normally do the District 6 Coffee, then show up and volunteer instead. Yep. Excellent. Further announcements? Thanks for the reminder about the Convoy of Hope. If there's no further announcements, I'll make a motion that we adjourn, and then we will go into our workshop. So motion is to adjourn. Second. Motion has been made and then seconded by Vice Mayor Hoheisel. All in favor said motion, please respond by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. The ayes have it. The ayes do indeed have it. Uh, we are adjourned. The chair recognizes the city manager uh, to start our, our council workshop. Thank you, Mayor. Floor is yours. Yep. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, we have two items for you today. Um, the first one is a follow-up discussion regarding our infill development and housing affordability uh, strategies, uh, some uh, analysis of uh, incentives that the council had put in place on a pilot basis, as well as discussion about uh, direction going forward. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tori Anderson. Honorable Mayor, members of council, uh, thank you for the opportunity. Troy Anderson, Assistant City Manager. Uh, and as Bob indicated, um, I somewhat titled this presentation Convergence and just there's a handful of previous conversations that at this point in time are really sort of converging. Um, I'm going to try to walk through each one of those and how that has brought us to where we are today, as well as what this might mean for moving forward. So as indicated, uh, there was a previous conversation around the Affordable Housing Fund, um, previous conversation around the Urban Infill Program, uh, and the Facade Improvement Program. So if you'll recall back in January of 22, Housing and Community Services presented Affordable Housing Fund Implementation Plan. Uh, I was part of a city allocation of $5 million from the American Rescue Plan Act. As a result of the U.S. Treasury final rule for ARPA fiscal recovery fund dollars and how they're spent, uh, there will be some revisions coming to you next month um, with regards to that affordable housing plan implementation program plan. I'm not going to steal Sally's thunder. She's going to come back with that here in a couple weeks. One aspect of that that I will touch on, though, is uh, the Wichita Housing Authority home sort of plan program and how the program hasn't changed much with regards to how the city intends to continue to expend that $5 million. More specifically, um, back in fall of 2021, this started uh, with some conversations, we received uh, some feedback from uh, Development Strategies, a consultant um, who started identifying all of the Wichita Housing Authority single-family residential homes 
and uh, the quarter mile radius around each one of those. So during that presentation, you all saw kind of a group one sale on MLS. These were 37 now, back then it was 34, we've had actually, actually identified three more. 37 homes that are truly scattered that group one will be simply to put those out there to the free market in an attempt to dispose of those. Um, unfortunately, our real estate division is not sort of MLS certified, so we're going to continue to market those through our real estate division. So just want to clarify, it will not be going through MLS, but we will continue to market and um, convey those through the real estate division. Additionally, you'll notice, and again, not to steal any thunder, but previously we requested that the net proceeds from the sales to pay pre-development expenses with remaining going to the affordable housing fund. That's no longer an option, and again, that'll come back to you in more explanation here in a couple weeks. The group two, um, we'll call it group two A and two B, right, uh, was really a, a truly cluster set of single family residential homes. Uh, one grouping was 23 homes around Haskell and St. Clair, um, and the other one was uh, about 43 homes around Minnesota and 25th. So these two clusters are going to be the two first groups that will also go out for disposition. And so as part of the affordable housing fund, our intent is to use those affordable housing funds to help the buyer renovate those and get those back out into the, the hands of property owners, homeowners, um, in a response to sort of preserve the existing housing stock that we already have. Just to kind of help paint the picture, right? So if we received a $5 million allocation, right, if each of those 66 homes took advantage of the $40,000 cap, arguably we could expend roughly $2.6 million of that $5 million just within those group 2A and 2B uh, disposition, leaving us about $2.3 million left over. Additionally, if we kind of keep thinking through the rest of those clusters, right? So that only responds to 66 of those 300 plus homes, right? If we thought about how the rehab component of the affordable housing fund might be taken advantage of by neighboring property owners within a quarter mile, if we identified maybe 500,000 for the quarter mile rehab around one of those clusters, another 500,000 for the quarter mile around the other cluster, you could see how quickly um, the affordable housing fund would be drawn down to maybe $1.3 million to go along with the disposition of the remaining single family residential homes. So not much has changed. There will be some changes coming back to you all here in uh, a couple of weeks again. Um, but we wanted to make sure that we kind of communicated that our, our intent is still to use that $5 million allocation in the disposition uh, of a number of these housing authority, single family residential homes, getting them back into the market. It's really an effort around preservation of existing housing stock, and that'll be a, a theme that I will continue to kind of uh, emphasize as I go through sort of the convergence of a, num a number of these other conversations. Okay, so the next one was last fall, we did uh, an urban infill program uh, to try and incentivize infill. And I want to emphasize infill because ultimately that's the way the program was laid out and how we have begun to evaluate whether or not that infill program is working or not. So you'll recall that the geography associated with that infill program was limited to formative areas and that uh, the incentives were a waiver of permit fees and the reimbursement of landfill costs. So as you can see here in front of you, uh, this is a map of those formative areas. So that's the geography. And then here's an analysis of the permit activity that we have seen over the last three quarters. Okay, so it went into effect 
the beginning of Q4 22 through end of Q2 and 23, so three quarter analysis. That's the that's the the tall bar that you see here on the right representing 2023. We then went back and looked at that same period cycle in previous years. We've we've actually been um, really excited about a new tool we have at, at, at our disposal. We've been working with our GIS department. Um, we've extracted all of the permit data uh, from our building uh, uh, department, and, and we've now mapped it, and we can now drill in and, and do inquiries for it and really produce some really exciting stuff. Upon first glance, this looks really exciting, right? This looks like we have an increase in valuation over those three quarters and we saw an increase in permits over those three quarters. Unfortunately, upon closer inspection, there were some nuances around that data that I need to point out to show that perhaps the program didn't work as we originally intended it to, right? More specifically, you'll notice in 2023, the way we've stacked this, there were two significant multifamily residential projects that were permitted in the Q4 of 22. These were just south of the Wichita State University campus. The reason why I point these out is because these projects would have had to have been planned for well in advance of actually pulling the permit in Q4 of 22. So the incentive program, the infill program, did not sort of spawn these projects. These were already in the pipeline. So if we take those two projects out, right, which totaled some $12.8 million in valuation, you can see how actually the permit activity starts to uh, decline and uh, the valuation that's being added certainly falls off, right? So deeper dive into the analysis, the infill program that we constituted last fall isn't kind of generating the infill development that we're hoping for. This is where I want to start trying to make the distinction between infill development and preservation of existing housing stock. Oddly enough, what we did see is a lot of those permits really were for sort of preservation of existing housing, right? They weren't infill projects, but they were permits associated with things like water heater replacement or re-roofs or, you know, those kind of ancillary types of permits that really lend itself to preservation of existing housing stock. Again, a theme I'll continue to... Troy, it wasn't a yep. lack of awareness. I mean, we marketed this pretty well to um, remodelers and, and developers and so forth. Yeah, in fact, um, from what I understand, regardless of whether or not anybody was aware of the project, those properties are flagged in the system and the fees are automatically waived as a result of just applying for a permit within those areas. So even if somebody wasn't even aware of it, we were, it's not like somebody had to ask for it, right? Uh, the way it was programmed in the system is that those properties that were located in those formative areas would automatically qualify within the system. So it, yes, it was part and parcel. We did advertising, marketing campaign for the project. Now, again, we're kind of three quarters in, right? Um, there's a lot of other economic factors out there that might kind of lend itself to the, but again, just looking at the three quarters worth of data and comparing it to the same three quarters in previous cycles, it, it's not moving the needle, right? And, I, and what I'm about to explain maybe kind of shed some light on maybe why, right? That maybe we sort of missed the target, not only geographically, but also from an incentive standpoint. Okay, so if we're talking about infill development, right? I'm gonna go back to 2018, really, um, we started at a really high level. What are we trying to accomplish? What are the goals and objectives of the city, right? We think back to the comprehensive plan. There's an urban infill strategy within the comprehensive plan, which led to Places for People back in 2018. In Places for People, it really kind of helps guide us in how we should approach urban infill. So for example, um, there's this idea of the neighborhood investment framework, right? And there's this transition from free market to community development. And so on one end of the spectrum, right, you have the free market. The free market's gonna invest in infill within the ECA in areas that just make sense for all of the free market reasons, right? 
On the other end of the spectrum is that community development, right? That's the areas that are in most need of investment, but they're not receiving that free market investment. And in the middle, right, we have this adjacency moment, momentum, and that's a theme that I'm going to really, again, kind of continue to try to drive home of we sort of skipped over adjacency momentum. We went right from free market, we went to right into community development and tried to create community development. Community development is a long-term investment strategy, right? If we really want to see change and growth, we really need to kind of focus here in this adjacency momentum phase of community development. On that same page, there's the second um, evolution of revitalizing neighborhoods, right? And so you see this transition from areas that are formative to areas that are emerging to areas that are flourishing to areas that are maturing. And there's a progression amongst those neighborhoods, right, as a result of investment. And so formative are those areas, again, in the most need. However, they're not seeing that free market investment the other end of the spectrum, the maturing and the flourishing, that's really where you're seeing a lot of the free market investment. So how do we come alongside free market investment in adjacency momentum, in areas that are sort of emerging and flourishing, which is really a focus geographically that I'll uh, continue to kind of drive home, rather than just formative, if, if we're shifting geographies, right, and aligning emerging and flourishing with adjacency momentum, the idea is that we'll now sort of get a better return on investment um, because we're aligning with free market. Okay, so um, the next point I want to kind of identify, which again was a really interesting um, illustration that was provided in Places for People, right? If you look at the recommendation that came out of Places for People, um, based on analysis of places and the lynching analysis, several neighborhoods are identified and it goes through this whole explanation. But it didn't just focus on neighborhoods, right? You can also see in this illustration there's an emphasis on nodes. There's an emphasis on corridors, right? It's a comprehensive approach. With that being said, I really wanted to call out a couple of key strategies and targets that were specifically identified in Places for People as well that really helps us kind of understand the direction that maybe we should go, right? So under broad strategies, obviously we want to create tools and target incentives to cause infill and redevelopment to occur in desired areas. We tried that at a very sort of micro scale, right? My, my recommendation is we continue to analyze that and really create a more robust incentive package, something I'll get to here in just a little bit. I don't know, strategy number five, five, provide a diversity of housing options to attract new residents and allow existing residents to remain in the ECA. The key here being diversity of housing options. Again, another point I'll, I'll drive home here in a little bit, right? This isn't just single family residential. This isn't two family residential, right? This is the whole gamut of diversity of housing options. This is townhomes, this is six plexes, 12 plexes, 24 plex, right? It's, it's the whole, there'll be a theme missing middle housing here in a little bit I'll show you that really kind of illustrates the, the spectrum of housing types and how the market, the consumer is really responding to wanting to know and understand what options they have about, available in a diverse housing market. Strategy number six, encourage infill and redevelopment that's contextual, contextual to the environment in which it's incurred. We've had a number of conversations with folks over the last several months, and there continues to be a common theme, right? And, and I think it's absolutely consistent with strategy number six. And that is, we have existing single family residential neighborhoods. When we start introducing a diversity of housing types within traditional single family residential neighborhoods, one of the first responses that the neighborhood want to say is, how does this fit within the integrity of the existing neighborhood, right? And this point drives that home. The infill development that we're striving for, right, has to be complementary to the existing integrity, architectural quality, culture of those neighborhoods. We can't take 
a suburban housing model and put it into uh, an interior ECA housing subdivision. That just doesn't work, right? So we need to make sure that as we're continuing to promote and encourage the infill development, that we're keeping in mind that the infill has to be contextual to the environment in which it's occurring. Um, okay, targets. I found this one really interesting, right? Because this is a, target number five really begins the shift in thinking, and I'm just gonna frame target number five around the comparison between affordable housing versus housing affordability, right? It's really common for folks to say, we need more affordable housing, we need more affordable housing, we need more affordable housing. Well, when we all kind of say affordable housing, that means one thing. When we're talking about housing affordability, that can mean something wildly different, right? And so one of the targets that came out of that was to create 350 new net housing units within the ECA annually. That's a lot, by the way. That's a lot of housing units within the ECA. It's a great goal and we're, we're gonna continue to strive for it, but provide a mix of predominantly market rate units, not affordable housing units, market rate units with some subsidized units and a mixture of types, including two-thirds multifamily units comprised of row houses, small-scale walk-ups and flats, and only a third single-family infill and redevelopment, right? So when you start reading through that, that's a target that says it's not just single-family residential infill. That's not what we're trying to accomplish, right? And we're not just trying to build affordable housing units, which are sort of the subset. In fact, we're going through the exercise right now of we're trying to dispose of 350-ish single-family resident within the Wichita Housing Authority portfolio, right? We really got to start thinking differently about what infill development looks like. Charlie, and then, may I ask a yeah. question? I'm sorry. Can you go? You said something that I think is really interesting. When people talk about affordable housing, yep. the question is, well, what does that mean, right? Exactly. What's affordable to, you know, Councilmember Johnson versus me versus anyone else? But you said something about affordable housing versus housing, housing affordability. affordability. Can you explain that to me, like if I were, you know, your neighbor at the mailbox this afternoon? Because I really like this concept. I just want to make sure I completely understand it, or maybe not completely. At least I have a grasp of it. Because I haven't heard this concept before, and I'd love to learn more. Sure. Um, and I actually have a slide on it here in just oh, a little okay. bit, and I'll Sorry. get to it. But the short answer is affordable housing in the context of what we talk about is subsidized, right? It's government subsidized. It's, it's Sally's, I keep looking at Sally because she's here in the audience, right? It's Sally's Housing and Community Service Department division of the city. That's what they deal with all day, every day. It's subsidized housing. Housing affordability really speaks to kind of what you're talking about, right? What's affordable to you might be different than what's affordable to me might be what's affordable to somebody else, right? It really is based on, on income and expenses. It's not based on the area median income and your percentage of area median income, right? Again, I got a slide here that kind of breaks down a little bit, but that's the distinction. When we say affordable housing, what we're really talking about is subsidized housing, right? For those folks that are in the less than area median income who are taking vouchers and otherwise, that's affordable housing. Housing affordability is just a response to what are the market conditions out there? How do we start defining what the average rents are, the average home prices are, and whether or not that's affordable to somebody based on their income? That was great. <coughs> yep. Yep. I don't know if you have a slide for this one as well, <laughs> but um, how far are we off the uh, 350 new housing units within the ECA? Um, boy, that's a great question. Um, I do not have that answer. I will tell you, I will go back and since, because we do now have the permit data, I'll go back and I'll start trying to identify all of the uh, housing units that we've created each year. Now that with this new tool that we've been working to, we now can kind of inquiry that and I'll, I'll get you that information. Okay, appreciate it. Yep. Okay, so with that being said, back in um, 2020, in fall of 2020, we 
again, hire development strategies to help us understand better what that infill program really might look like, right? And as part of a memorandum they provide us, they really do dove into node prioritization. They really started analyzing not the districts, right, not the neighborhoods, but those nodes, those intersections that were identified in places for people and really began to kind of prioritize where the greatest opportunity was. They started with just an initial top 10. Then they added a market economic and community development component and then they added an equity component. You can see the final rankings here um, include not only the initial top 10, the market economic community, but also the equity component. They identify the top 10 nodes. And what I really want to kind of point out was if you look at the neighborhood cycle, these are not in neighborhoods that are just formative, right? They're in neighborhoods that are formative and emerging or maturing and emerging. It really is that balanced approach of where the opportunities exist based on market, economy, community development, equity. So if we go back to the original map that was came out, we're proposing a somewhat shift in uh, geography away from the formative areas to better align with all of the information that we've been provided today, right? that more closely mirrors the conversations that came out of places for people and focuses it around corridors and nodes, right? We're still going to get into those formative areas because what we're looking at is, for example, a quarter mile on either side, uh, excuse me, an eighth mile on either side of a corridor and a quarter mile around a node. So we're still going to get into these formative areas, right? But this better aligns with the geography and the recommendations coming out of places for people, as well as permit activity, right? We've started analyzing the permit activity around, and a lot of the permit activity over the last five years, particularly on the north side, really aligns with adjacency to these corridors and nodes. The other thing we're going to do is uh, recommend a uh, kind of re revised set of incentives. Um, we want to come back to you all with some amendments to our economic development guidelines that really bolster some of the incentives of what, what I'm talking about here today. We're going to look at all of those incentive types, programs. We're going to base this around performance-based value add um, projects and, and making sure that they're net positive for all the taxing jurisdictions. I'll show that in more detail here in just a minute. Okay, the third conversation sort of convergence is really where I segue at this point in time because this was an incentive tool to try to encourage and promote uh, development investment in our ECA, which has worked wonderful, by the way, right? Um, but it has its limitations, and that's kind of what I want to try to show here. So back in November, our offices uh, presented to you all this idea that this facade improvement pro program might be ending. Um, it's based on somewhat of a liberal interpretation of a very specific state statute. I think there's a better tool that's a little more robust, and I'll show you that here in just a second. But um, specifically, there were two components of the facade improvement program. There was the actual special assessment, right, which allowed for um, uh, the investment to occur, and then there was the grant part of it, right? There was a grant forgiveness. Our offices found no substantial correlation between the grant offering and the program participation, which is why back in November we encouraged and suggested not continuing to sort of fund the grant component of that, but just to focus on the special assessment side of it because it's working really, really well. Unfortunately, the program is limited in the sense that it's only the facade that is adjacent to the right-of-way, right? And that is a policy dictated of what we created when we started the program, or is that a state requirement? The program of limiting it is um, a result of the interpretation of the state statute. The state ta statute talks about those facades adjacent to the right-of-way, right? And so as an interpretation of the state statute, when we created the program, that was the limitation. That's consistent with the okay. statute. The alternative is the community improvement district tool, right? And there's two components of it. There's the sales tax rebate component of it, but there's also a special assessment component of it. 
the special assessment component of CID is not limited to those facades that are adjacent to a right-of-way. Now, I can do all, all facades. I can do things like public improvements, right? This tool becomes exponentially more powerful um, if utilized with regards to special assessments and preservation of existing housing stock, right? I also want to show this illustration here because this is a great example of how this tool may be currently underutilized, right? Because the CID has the two components of the sales tax rebate and the special assessment, if all we're looking at is the special assessment component, okay, fine, right? But if we're also looking at the sales tax rebate component, consider, if you will, a mixed-use multifamily residential and non-residential project. This is common throughout the nation right now. It's one of the hottest project types, right? Um, you might have a ground floor retail that, as it generates sales tax, can go back to offset the cost to construct or renovate a project such as this, which then drives down the housing affordability of the units within that project. Okay, so again, just a small example of how we might be able to better utilize uh, some of the tools that we already have in our toolbox. Another example is our industrial revenue bonds. <clears throat> there are two components to industrial revenue bond, right? There's the sales tax exemption and there's a property tax exemption. You all have seen a dozens of these every year, right? Historically, we have not used the property tax exemption when it comes to multifamily residential though, right? Federal tax code allows it. We've only locally restricted it. One of the suggestions I might make as we come back with revisions of the guidelines is using property tax exemption as part of multifamily residential, again, because with that property tax exemption, we now are able to drive down the cost of those units, creating more housing affordability, right? And I wanna plug this Here's our pilot origination fee, right? This is gonna be consistent with some of the other tools. Um, I'm gonna demonstrate that when we get to TIF, right? But one of the things that we wanna make sure in all of these programs is all of the taxing jurisdictions continue to be, continue to be made whole, right? So no, none of the taxing jurisdictions will uh, sort of be out any revenues. Uh, it really becomes that but for case, right? And it's really only on the performance, the value add that is created that those revenues come back to the property owner, developer, et cetera, to pay back their investment and drive down housing affordability. Another tool in the toolbox that we haven't used recently, neighborhood revitalization areas, NRAs. It was a tool that had been used historically um, it allows a rebate back of the school district tax, the county tax, and the city tax. Um, I'm, I've been led to believe that we had it at one point in time. Um, it was a very large geography, and for whatever reason, the school district uh, and the county at some point in time said, hey, uh, we want to try to reevaluate that. Um, they opted out, which left only the city tax to be rebated, which didn't make a lot of sense for a lot of... So we have re-engaged USD 259 of late and are having conversations that if we limit the geography to those sort of nodes and quarters as we've described them, would the, U, would the school district, would USD 259 be willing to participate again? This could be a really powerful tool, um, especially because the eligible expenses associated with NRA are very diverse. But again, there will be a pilot origination fee, there will be a pass. So even if these folks participate, it's only on the value add that is being created, right? The base value of all of these projects, whether you're talking about CID, um, NRA, TIF, there's a pass through of the base value so all the taxing jurisdictions continue to be made whole, which is this illustration here. So this is tax income from financing. Um, at its simplicity, right? You see here, uh, in orange is the revenue that is available to the taxing entities. 
in green is the revenue that goes back to the investor as a result of the investment that's made and the value that has been created. So you see on the one end, begin redevelopment. Once redevelopment begins, the value begins to climb. The base value is pulled out, passed through all to the taxing jurisdictions, and the revenue that is added as a result of the taxes that are paid because of the value that has been increased goes back to the investor over a period of time. And then once the redevelopment obligation is repaid, now there's a huge windfall of revenue for all the taxing jurisdictions, right? This is a model that's used across the nation. It's performance-based, it's value-add. We wanna continue with that th theme through all of our tools, making sure that we're getting the performance we're looking for, but continuing to think about robust incentives back to those investors for investing in our ECA. The last one was fee waivers and expense reimbursements. Obviously, we kind of know how that's playing out right now. Um, so this really becomes sort of this complex matrix, right, of is it a property tax exemption tool? Is it a property tax rebate tool? Is it a neighborhood revitalization or is it a tax increment financing program? And the best way I can illustrate that is sort of this matrix here, right, that that a CID provides sales tax rebate and special assessment, IRBs provide, and this is a way that we can kind of pull out and as we're sitting down with folks, try to understand how best to utilize the tools that we have in our toolbox to facilitate the development that they're wanting to invest in. Okay, so I'm gonna shift real fast to, so how does that correlate to our public investment, right? What project should we invest in, when, where, and why, and how, right? So this came out of places for people as well, right? This was an illustration that was provided as part of that, so nothing new. I'm not suggesting anything. You'll notice the catalyst sites here, catalyst sites require significant investment in the public realm, catalyst project. And eventually over time, as public investment continues to decline as a result of private investment, Right, this, this area between catalyst and incubation is that public-private partnership realm, right? Eventually, with adjacency momentum, we, we've seen free market investment. We're now coming alongside in adjacency momentum, which will then launch, cities can pull back, and now we've created that snowball effect that free market is continuing to invest in areas that they might not have otherwise, right? So there's a number of aspects of public investment that we want to talk about, because this, again, complex matrix, right? We've talked a little bit about affordable housing versus housing affordability. Here's that slide I was talking right? When we talk about affordable housing, we talk about HUD, and we talk about area median income, and fair market rents, and low income housing tax credits. This is subsidized housing, right? When we talk about housing affordability, what we're talking about is household incomes and household expenses and making sure homeowners are you know, not spending more than 30% of their income on their mortgage or on their rent, right? Um, there's a housing affordability index. There are market rents. Those are, that's how we start making the distinction between those two. And interestingly, when we start evaluating the market here in Wichita, Sedgwick County, Back in 2021, the Kansas Needs Assessment, Kansas Statewide Housing Assessment produced the following for Sedgwick County. Really fascinating graphs here, and I wanna show you why. So on the top right corner, um, it talks about existing housing stock attainable to inc income groups. I'm gonna zoom in here in just a second. Talk. The other table is the balance of existing housing stock that would be attainable to income groups in 2019. The circle is Sedgwick County. The rest of those are sort of geographies compared to across the state, right? And the bar you see there, the red bar, represents area median income. Again, I'm gonna take a closer look at those, each of those here in just a second, but I wanna make sure that I make this distinction. There is a need for additional affordable housing units for households with income at or below 30% of the area median income. I wanna make no distinction here, right? What I'm about to show you does not dismiss the fact that there is a need for additional affordable housing units for households with income at or below 30% of the area median income. 
The development of preservation property to meet this need will need significant subsidies with long-term use restrictions, such as community development block grant, home and housing choice voucher resources provided through the Housing and Community Service Department. So let me show you what I mean when I say that. So if you'll notice here, see this bar here? We have just under 10,000 sort of housing units where the existing housing stock is not attainable to that under $25,000 household income, right? Th this is a market segment that we really need to try and respond to. Oddly enough, these two market segments, right? We have a surplus. We have a surplus of some maybe 30,000 housing units that are attainable to the income groups within the twenty-five dollars to $75,000 range. Now, I think there's, I think this graph is a little bit nuanced in the sense that a, a lot of that housing stock is presumably aging, in need of investment, in areas that are not desirable, right? So there's probably a lot of circumstances that are leading to that. But what this is telling us is not necessarily that there's a need for as much of affordable housing as we all think there might be. There is a need for housing affordability, absolutely, right? And that's exactly what these illustrations, more specifically on this graph, you can see the bar there represents area median income. So if you look at Sedgwick County, right, here's that under 25,000 segment that suggests we have a gap in units, right? But if you look at that 25 to 75,000 range, we have many units, again, they may not be high quality. They may not even be livable, right? A lot of these distinctions don't make whether or not these are livable units, how much investment needs to be made. They're just purely looking at some of the numbers, right? So take these two uh, with a little bit of grain of salt, right? We want to continue to dive into where we can respond to the needs of the community in regards to housing. But I can tell you right now, this is a great opportunity for preservation of existing housing stock. This is existing housing stock that if we can preserve it, we could add several thousand units back onto our inventory that are now affordable to folks because now they're livable, right? So preservation of existing housing stock versus new construction, which is my segue into that next section, right? New construction, there are significant barriers, land and infrastructure costs, cost of building construction, access to capital, interest rates, and now if we're doing new construction, qualified buyer and higher rents, right? Um, it wouldn't surprise me if the uh, a new home nowadays, entry level, I'm gonna, 250, 240, 250? Yeah, folks, folks who are coming out of school, high school, college, or otherwise, they're not affording entry level homes, right? And so um, this is a real opportunity to really kind of start thinking differently about, yes, there needs to be a balanced approach. We do need new construction. We do need 350 housing units annually in our urban core, right? We need new construction. But we also can take advantage and minimize that number by just preserving the existing housing stock we already have. An interesting uh, statistic that came out of the 22, excuse me, 2020 census data, we as a city have a total of about 175,000 housing units. 91% of them are occupied, but we have over 15,000 vacant housing units, right? That was a wildly interesting statistic that, again, kind of drives home the point of an opportunity for us to look at our existing housing stock and see what we can do to preserve that. Yeah, um, that, that kind of follows up on a question I just had. Um, what plans do we have to revitalize the existing housing units that you're talking about? the vacant houses, underutilized housing, because I think that's, like you said earlier, for that 25 to 75,000 age group or um, income group, um, that's where we could focus in. That those houses are allegedly there, but they're still not really actually on the market because they are just vacant right now and not being utilized. Right, so um, it's a combination of, of things, right? Um, we talked at the beginning about the Affordable Housing Fund and how we want to transition some of the housing authority properties back into the hands of private property owners, right, and, and the private sector. Um, that's part of it, right? That's 
arguably a couple hundred units that will be an investment, right? But we also have t tools, community development block grant dollars, home dollars, et cetera. Um, we have a lot of subsidies that can help preserve the existing housing stock. Um, combine that with what we're talking about with private sector investment and public-private partnerships where we come alongside free market investment, eventually the domino, it will trickle out into those neighborhoods. Eventually it'll be the block face two blocks over, and then it'll be the block face on the other side, and then it'll be the back side of that block, and then the back side of that block. There's this domino effect that as you see investment that is being made and you see the rehab, it will trickle into the neighborhoods. Yes, it, it's gonna take time. If you look back to those two, the neighborhood investment strategy, those community redevelopment goals, those are long-term approaches. Those are 15, 20 year approaches, right? These are not quick fixes. If we're gonna really change the makeup of our ECA with regards to that, it's a long-term approach, right? And we can kind of work our inside out as well. I alluded to the program that we did last fall, right? We saw a lot of reinvestment through the use of fee waivers and Oddly enough, the infill redevelopment, we only had one individual take advantage of the landfill reimbursement expenses, and I think it was a couple hundred bucks. It's like four or five hundred dollars. We've only had one individual take advantage of that incentive in the last three quarters. Most of the uh, incentives that we've taken advantage of over the last three quarters <clears throat> have really only been on fee, fee waivers. Excuse me. Yeah. I, I, so it's a combination of both. I do feel like we could advertise some of these programs a little more for the public to utilize them. Um, another thing, do we have any programs out there that help people pass the title from one family member to another? Um, I know Council Member Johnson and I have talked about that being something in our district, so that's a big issue. We constantly have people coming up for the homes that are supposed to be demoed who they're going through the process currently, and that seems to be one of the barriers like with a lot of these vacant houses. Like probate? Yeah, the probate, yeah. Um, I, we can certainly explore it, right? I, unfortunately, I don't have an answer for you today, right? Um, as you can see, kind of to immediately answer your question, right? Yeah. The tools that we have available for for preserving existing housing stock was my next slide, right? So <laughs> thanks for the question, right? We have affordable housing fund. We have community development fund, home, LIHTC, low interest loan and revolving loan programs. We also have the Wichita Land Bank. We're trying to figure out how to utilize the land bank, right? I know in other communities, the land bank is an incredible tool for helping clear title, right? And helping to respond to it with title issues. So that could be the solution, right? Um, Again, don't have an answer for you today, but within the makeup of the tools that we have in front of us, I, I think there might be a solution. Well, in, in District 1, there is the grant, and that grant does help with deed work, and there have been a few people who have applied for help with that to get the deed work done and get the property in their name. Yep. Yep. Just District 1. It was the District 1 high funds. Okay. Council Member Williams started that. Um, Okay, so the last component of public investment, right, and I touched on this a little while ago, is all about density, right? The more density we can create, the better we can take advantage of the economies of scale and the existing infrastructure. There's uh, this idea of missing middle housing that came out several years ago, and I can't illustrate it better, right? It's not just single-family residential, right? That, that solution has its limitations. And it's not just duplexes, right? We've only, if all we're thinking about is duplexes, we're only scaling this by one, right? What we're missing out on in the conversation is everything in between, right? Four plexes, six plexes, 12 plexes, townhouses. I can tell you across the nation, there's live work units, right? In a, following the pandemic, right? Live work units have become wildly intriguing to a lot of folks who, live above and work below and their home is their place of work and so we don't have a lot of those products out there right so there's a whole spectrum of infill housing types um, that doesn't even take into consideration again the big multifamily residential projects and if you want to check this out missing missile missing middle housing.com got a lot of really good information again not a new concept. In fact, I went back and I was actually looking through some old presentations from Places for People, and this was one of the slides, right? Um, so this is, has been in our 
portfolio to chase for, for several years now. Um, oddly enough, I'm going to read through a few of these, but as I come back to the Kansas Statewide Housing Assessment, the executive summary, these were some of the recommendations that came out that were, as part of interviews, some of the quotes and through some of the interviews, what the consumers were actually saying, right? The consumers were saying, we're looking for a demand for rental housing variety beyond apartments. Speaks to missing middle housing, right? A demand for smaller footprints and lower maintenance options. Probably not single family residential, right? Uh, over the last two decades, there's been limited amounts of new construction outside of single family detached homes. Again, looking for that variety of housing type. Subdivision activity over the past decade has been steady, but many people felt these were only subdivisions and not neighborhoods, right? So how do we start thinking about incorporating other amenities, access to amenities like health care and education and so on in close proximity to the neighborhoods that we're really trying to revitalize? Participants noted a uh, need to create more neighborhoods with housing variety and services that create a greater sense of community. Pent up demand for housing products to meet the needs of every stage of life, right? That's, I can't say that last part better. It's like an investor, right? We, we, we want a diverse, we want a, um, a varied portfolio, right? We want a diverse portfolio. We want to try to respond to not just one market segment, but all market segments for uh, everyone in every stage of life. This just kind of goes through a little bit just to kind of help illustrate, right, of every project is different. If we're looking down on the bottom here, is it a publicly funded project or a privately funded project and the, 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 the range of funding versus is it an affordable housing project versus how, a publicly funded affordable housing project is going to look wildly different than a privately funded housing affordability project, right? And you begin to kind of see the spectrum as it relates to housing price, housing stock. Right, a publicly funded preservation program has wildly different results than a privately funded new construction project. And lastly, you know, a high density publicly funded project is going to look wildly different than a privately funded low density project. And you get this really unique kind of, there's not one solution, right? There's not one, every single project is going to look different and the tools that we have in our toolbox need to be able to respond differently for every single one of those projects. So in summary, quick summary, um, we talked about affordable housing fund. There are going to be revisions to the affordable housing fund implementation program plan coming to you here in the next couple of weeks. Although not much has changed, there has been a lot of change, but we still have a plan on how we plan on expending that $5 million. Um, the disposition of the Wichita Housing Authority single family homes. <clears throat> and then the, sort of the convergence even further of urban infill and facade improvement program talked about infill versus preservation, the goals and objectives, what are we trying to accomplish, shifting the geography focus and creating more robust performance-based incentive packages, talked about housing stock, price, type, and then ultimately in public-private partnerships. And I'm here to answer any questions. I know there's a lot of information. I appreciate that. These are not easy conversations, right? There's a lot of information behind these, so I appreciate your patience and here to answer any questions. Troy, can we kind of start out talking about the marketing of the properties we have? We're not going out to the multi-list, so what do our marketing activities consist of? Um, that's a great question. So we have website presence, right? We, we have a website that shows the properties that are available. We'll continue to use our channels of communicating uh, with the real estate community and otherwise that we have these properties available for sale. Uh, there's an RFP that's going to be going out uh, that will be uh, published uh, specifically around the clusters, right? Um, but we're going to continue to try to promote and encourage through, through word of mouth, through our tools that we have available to us, the website, et cetera, uh, the RFP process. Um, but any help that we can get in trying to communicate the fact that we have these properties. And we're going through, they're not quite ready for disposition. There's a, we have to go through uh, the environmentals first. Once we're cleared of the environmentals, then we'll be able to publish these as being for sale. Um, but uh, yes, unfortunately, none of our real estate 
folks in our real estate division can use the MLS listings. We're not going to be able to use the MLS listing, but we're going to try every other avenue um, and course available to us to continue to promote and encourage. It's in our best interest to try to dispose of those as quickly as possible because of the revenue that we are hoping to receive from this in trying to finance some of the projects that you all are familiar with. So if you're not a city hall insider, so to speak, you're probably not going to hear about these properties. Um, again, if any, any help we can get in spreading the word, we are open for suggestions. Okay. Well, can you further explain the $40,000 cap to me? There's not a lot of properties yep. out there for $40,000. So the $40,000 cap is part of the affordable housing fund program right that for there were three components and i'm really going to butcher this so sally i apologize but there were three components one component of it was sort of the new uh the existing single family homes so as we offer up the single family homes the two clusters right the 66 homes each of those 66 homes as the buyer acquires those properties puts in an offer through the rfp process on those properties they can also then take advantage of the $40,000 cap of affordable housing funds. So they're gonna bring dollars to the table with their investment. We're gonna shift those sort of title over to them. The 40,000 is a way for them to make improvements to those homes, because right now those homes aren't necessarily marketable, right? It just helps bridge the gap between how much it's gonna to cost to acquire the homes at the rates that we need to receive in order to dispose of them with HUD, right? And helping to make the improvements that really ready those to get those back out to the private sector. So are but we doing any kind of preference to owner occupants, trying to get owner occupants in these houses? Um, we looked at our tools, we talked about some lender tools. I mean, are we working with a lender for rehabilitation or anything like that? Because I personally would like to see these homes get in front of homeowners versus more landlords. Mm -hmm. So what the buyers do with them, did I pass that? Nope, oh, there we go. What the buyers do with them after could be sell them, could be renting, right? Um, the recommendation that came as part of the affordable housing fund $5 million implementation strategy was a blended approach, right? The approach was both. It's both single family, home ownership, right? And so, yes, the developers will be able to sort of come in. And when I say developers, it could be an individual. If somebody wants to come in and put in an offer on one home, we would entertain that, right? The reality is, is that the capital that is gonna be necessary to acquire a number of these homes and make that investment is probably not going to be, the audience is probably not going to be the individual homeowner. Now, once, once the buyer comes in and buys 10, 15, 20 homes, right, because you're gonna need significant capital to do that, then you're taking advantage of perhaps a $40,000 cap for each one of those. So let's say 10 homes, $400,000 you're getting of affordable housing funds on top of the dollars that you're investing. Now, once I renovate those homes, now when I go to sell those, right, maybe I'm selling five of them. Maybe I'm maintaining five of them for rental properties, right? Once they're into the hands of the folks who put in the RFP, it'll be a blended approach. But we, we don't think we can scale it down to, you know, one, most homeowners aren't going to hear about it. They're not going to see it on the website or they're not gonna have that close of attachment to whatever brokers we're talking to. And then, you know, if you look at the $40,000 cap, is there an opportunity to try to use that as some down payment incentive to putting the money back into the property to get the appraisal up higher? To, I just, I just I'm, I'm really trying to throw some stuff out there to see what sticks, to see what can we do to get homeowners in some of these? Because I, I think that's, as we look at rebuilding the core, We've, we've got to keep people, you know, got to keep long term sure. homeowners in there so, and giving them an opportunity to have some home equity to, to build wealth for them and their family. And this is a great question. Really, what you're diving into is really the 
affordable housing plan implementation plan that city council already reviewed and approved and the revisions are coming back next week so i'm going to turn it over to sally to maybe respond more specifically around that Thank you, Councilmember Palupa. Great question. Uh, for the affordable housing, for affordable home ownership, the properties will be layered with down payment assistance through a home. So they will have the home restrictions as well as the administrative funding related to home for the compliance period. Any property under the RFPs that wants to do rental will have to identify that up front and apply for project-based vouchers in those so that we are in there every year for a minimum of 15 years while they do that. These are our mechanisms to be able to um, make sure that they stay affordable and then bring other resources to the table. So in the example of an, a developer comes in, wants to buy 10 homes at market value, applies for 400,000, we're just making nice easy numbers here. They will work and will have to have buyers that have gone through HUD certified housing counseling. Um, they'll have the resources for down payment assistance through the home program. It is about having that pipeline of qualified households that can be mortgageable, but then still also have the supports in order to make them successful homeowners. We have indicated, we look at a, a neighborhood is, uh, the healthiest neighborhoods have 75% homeownership, 25% rentals. The Affordable Housing Review Board will have um, the, the job of reviewing applications and making recommendations as to which um, proposals to recommend to the council for approval. But in the end, the council has the authority um, to deem whether or not we move forward with which particular proposals. So will this look like a, if an investor wants to come in there and flip them, so to speak? Is there seasoning periods or anything like that? Yes. Um, absolutely. Ha that's exactly why we need to have those other regulatory programs layered on top of the affordable housing funds so that we do have those clawback provisions. So just having home funds in them alone are going to have requirements that if they tried to flip them, actually, you know what, those, all that money has to come back. So mm -hmm. we have a deed restriction on yeah, Absolutely. On, not on the first 37. Mind you, remember, the first 37 are just being sold. They're, they don't, they're so scattered, they don't really come together as a, as a project. As we've seen with our affordable housing developers, they get economies of scale by having close proximity and being able to mobilize their construction crews, et cetera. When they're so scattered, it's really challenging um, for them to be able to turn a profit on, on, and make it pencil in the long run. So those are just going out on the open market. And I've been assured by the real estate office that they're creating flyers also for each individual property that are going through the, the uh, Realtors Association of South Central Kansas to be sent to every real estate office in, in the city. So once those um, are approved for disposition, those activities will start happening. I mean, I, I mm -hmm. specifically keep thinking about the houses in my district on Haskell yep. and how those are just, to me, they're perfect starter homes mm -hmm. that will get people in there and buy them. And those are actually the 23 in, in pilot area two. And we're looking at that and not only the investment in those 23 homes, but also by being able to prioritize existing homeowner rehab in the area that surrounds it. We're really hoping that that's going to drive and make improvements to home values in the whole area. So I, I had a few I questions around housing affordability. I like that term. Yep. Um, so I, I do have some concerns because a lot of this um, I've been wanting to see for a while around the NRA, like your suggestions around IRBs, but I'm watching the free market work right now. And some of the new duplexes in District 1 are renting for $1,400, $1,500. It's not affordable for the folks on the lower end on the income scale. And I haven't heard any form of real cost controls in all of this. Um, you know, I'd love to see with the IRB idea, I mean, just going forward as people do those housing projects, we have some requirement that there's a 20% affordable, um, you know, unit rate and something like that. Or in this, I, I know the thought around the the TIF idea, but that means someone actually cares to reduce those costs. There's no requirement to reduce a cost. So there's a 
wider gap of revenue someone can make unless they actually care to reduce the cost for the end user that, that's in there. And I have concerns about not doing that because I think um, from what we've seen, you reduce the cost and that's just more money for the developer rather than the benefit to the person who might be in that space. So is that something that you've been considering that may come back as well? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it comes from both perspectives, right? Um, yes, the tools and the incentives that we um, are utilizing to encourage the infill development, there, there's a macroeconomic conversation, right, of supply and demand. The more supply that we can create, right, just the competitive nature of macroeconomics tells us that even though these folks might want to rent for a certain price point, if there's somewhat of a saturation of the market because there's an influx of housing, the market is going to somewhat dictate some of them. On the other hand, yes, you're right. The, the tools and incentives that we are trying to utilize respond to the goals and objectives set forth in the, implementa in the infill strategy, which means reduced rents. So yes, we can tie restrictions to those projects and those tools that we're utilizing. So when we come back with the revisions to the uh, design guidelines, those are absolutely things that we're going to take into consideration as we bring it back to you. Okay, because I, I guess the long term, I always think about what gentrification looks like. So if we have a whole block and there is like a half block in District 1 of brand new duplexes, I know how much those are renting out. After a while, you get more people in there that can afford that. You displace the people that are in that neighborhood. So right. that was a concern. And then to the no um, piece of this, specifically around the 13th and Hillside and 9th and Grove, um, those are nodes that look very attractive, and I have, I can't remember if that was the beginning of places for people. I still have that first book, but a lot of that is around the Rock the Block area, and there was an intentional effort by Habitat for Humanity to build in that area, which has drastically changed that neighborhood. I think they're at 97 houses now in six years, so it didn't take 15 to change it. If we have intentional efforts from organizations that maybe care a little bit less about the profit margin, uh, and just doing some good for a community, I think you could see more of an impact. And I, and I wonder if this more noted, scattered approach, I, I, I kind of get what you're saying about if you work in those areas, maybe that trickles out a little bit. But those two basically corner an intentional effort to invest in an area. And I, I wonder if we had some more areas throughout the city where we were intentional in a area the size from you know 13th to 9th hillside to, to grove something like that just in different places would we change more would that help those property values even folks in that area who may not have been able to afford a new house or get into a habitat program began to work on the facades of their homes new siding doors windows roofs so i just wonder if this is that right area or uh, will we see that around all of those nodes so I'm glad, I'm glad you kind of bring that up because I want to make sure that we're being clear too, right, that while these are target areas and these almost come with a, if you're sort of building in these areas, sort of the absolutely yes, let's come alongside you and help. This does not preclude us from investing outside of this, right? If there's a project given an opportunity, in fact, I can tell you right now, there's a project that we are working on that is outside of one of these areas they originally came in a, with a single family residential sort of infill component and we kind of said, hey, can you think about doing something a little more dense? Can you think of, and they went back to the drawing board and they said, yeah, actually man, we, we could really do kind of this thing and then we could get a little more density here in the middle and they're going out and sort of shopping it with the neighborhood right now. But if they come back with that project, now they're responding to the goals and objectives of the infill strategy. Now let us bring tools and incentives to the conversation as well. Again, it's outside of one of these target areas, but that doesn't preclude us from having those conversations about using the tools that we have in our toolbox to encourage achieving the goals and objectives of the infill strategy. Yes. If I could just jump in. <clears throat> the area that you talk about is a perfect example of that adjacency momentum. So the larger areas that you create or the more scattered the less opportunity to make a difference right because what you if you just look at that at the rock the block area look at what's happened to adjacent properties that are privately owned and the work that has been done by those property owners without any city assistance to upgrade their properties and so it seems to me that the more focused we can be 
the greater impact we can make, and you can start to see that switch from public to private investment. The other thing is not to get too hung up on new construction. I think Troy talked about the importance of maintaining housing stock and providing good housing, upgrading existing housing to give people housing opportunities that don't currently have them. So I, 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 it's a shift in our emphasis, recognizing, and, and this goes back to the work that was done last year, about a year ago, that talked about how much money has to go in to fill that gap for a new house, right, for the new construction. And that's a much smaller gap if we're talking about rehab of existing units. So I, I absolutely agree with yeah. that. I, I just think the challenges we've seen, I mean, every time we approve um, a demolition, is either family not having the resources, will they sell? Um, will folks be able to come in there and get those properties or some of the uh, the vacant ones and the, st the stuff we all hear, you know, being able to acquire those. I'd love to see all of those rehab yeah. and go out to families. It's just how do we get um, those into the hands of the folks who can afford to fix them up and then sell those to families and rent them out. And that, that's been the biggest challenge, I think. One of the things that we probably need to share with the council is uh, are the new data maps that we're doing through GIS. If you look at the um, rehab activity, when we were analyzing what was done with the incentive, you know, over the last three quarters, how the incentive money was spent, it's amazing how many rehab projects have been permitted in the ECA, right? Even before we did incentives, it was pretty significant. But I, to me, that's what gave me some hope that we can turn neighborhoods around through those reinvestments and then our targeted assistance to help, you know, uh, um, accelerate that. Yeah. I, I'm, like, I'm supportive of it, even if we wanted to extend it. Um, I think the council member blew ball's point as, as well earlier, just we got to find different ways to get the word out. I, I just talked to a group that just formed a, a company to kind of do this, and I told them about it, and one of the guys said, man, I wish I would have known that. I just paid all this money in this one area. I could have focused over here and not paid those permit fees. So, and I don't blame anyone on that. We just got to find the ways to connect to the folks who aren't aware. Agreed. If you, if you don't mind, if I, want, I want to piggyback on that a little bit. Sure. Um, you know, the past several months, Wichita has only had five to 600 houses in the whole city for sale. <coughs> We have 352. Why would we not utilize the MLS to get those out there? Um, so I think we could, right? I'm gonna, I'm gonna lean on maybe legal here for a little bit, but if we're gonna have an agent represent the city and take properties and put them on MLS, have to go through a competitive process and and make sure that that's available to any maybe one, maybe I'm out of my lane here a little bit. No, I, yeah, th there would need to be some process to select how that occurs. Whether whether we hire an agent, whether, I mean, property management is going to have some sort of existing contracts with those types of folks. Now, do we have a property agent for the city? I doubt it, but certainly I think that's something that we could explore, but he is correct. It would have to initially be vetted through the purchasing process and I think Josh left but but, but but there should be an opportunity for a city employee to be like a broad broker or something to be able to work that and to be able to run it through a real estate department I think I mean, that's I mean, somebody that that is hired by the city that directly represents the fiduciary responsibility of the city as well as what this council wants and I think that's something we can explore that's something that we can certainly delve into the legal ramifications of and the procurement process of that individual, whether it's a hired employee or a contract. I think that's something that we can talk about. Yep. Any other questions? No, well, just a comment. I appreciate your creative thinking around some of our incentives, uh, IRBs and CIDs. Uh, looking you. forward to continuing that discussion. Thank you. Appreciate it. And again, thanks for your time. I, I want to thank Troy and the, and the folks that worked with him because the idea was to bring a lot more data to the table so that we're better targeting our incentives and what and identifying what, what the gaps are. And so I, I do appreciate it because I think we're getting a lot more focused in, in how we're going to spend these dollars. All right. Well, thanks, Troy, for everything.
that you do and for the update of course go ahead and get into the um, next part of our workshop mayor this item has been uh, discussed by the council previously and uh, actually asked for feedback coming uh, from the planning commission uh, planning commission and it has to do with uh, uh, zone zoning rezoning notice notification areas and how large those should be um, I believe that the Planning Commission uh, decided not to bring a recommendation forward to you. However, some of you at least said you'd want to visit it and talk about it at workshop and maybe give clearer direction to the Planning Commission. So that's what today's meeting is all about. I'll turn it over to Scott Weedle. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning, Scott. Scott Wader from the Planning Department. Um, I do want to note that Ann Fox, the chairperson of the MAPC, has joined us today it's for the presentation. Uh, so as the manager had indicated, this is about uh, the notification for zoning cases, specifically the mailed out notification. And I'm gonna cover a variety of different formats that we use to get the word out about these, but the focus for today is gonna be on the mailed uh, portion. So again, it's a workshop, so it's an opportunity for you to ask questions, uh, to, for us to collect feedback, so please stop and ask questions at any point. In terms of the overview and what we're going to cover, here are the items that we'll cover. Uh, we'll go through all of these in much more detail, but just want to give you highlights on where we're going. In terms of interest uh, in this and, and the review process that we've done, as the manager indicated, we heard from uh, city council members that uh, there's interest in exploring how people are notified. We've also heard from members of the public, especially during zoning cases, about notification and questions that come up. And then also at the district advisory boards, I can think of at least two district advisory boards where questions have come up about mailed notifications and how far that goes and can it be extended or, or uh, what are the implications? Just two. Uh, just two that I can recall. Uh, it sounds like there's a lot more out there. So. In terms of the process to date, as the manager indicated, uh, we've been really bouncing this off of the MAPC advanced plans. That's a subcommittee of the Planning Commission. There are seven members that are on there. And these are the different meeting dates uh, that we took uh, those items to. They meet generally about once a month. So if you go online, you can find the videos, you can find the uh, notes that come out of those meetings. There are also um, three documents, memos, that have been created. I've got copies of those for you uh, in the back here. And uh, what we're doing is this information today in the PowerPoint is really drawn from those memos. So I'll have those for distribution after this presentation. So in terms of current practice, what do we do today? You're all very familiar with the zoning process. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time going through that, but. Um, really, this is a question about how do we get people informed about the process and give them the opportunity to engage in the process. So there's a variety of formats that we use to do this. Um, this is a quick table that just highlights those. We'll talk about each of these a little bit more in depth. So the first one is public newspaper. Uh, so we publish uh, a, a listing of the cases coming up in the MAPC meeting Scott, agendas. Sorry, does that require it to be the newspaper or just a legal notice? It is uh, required to be published in the paper of record. So uh, there's a newspaper that's officially the paper of record, and uh, there are two different newspapers, for instance, one for the city and one for the county, and the county changes theirs every so often. What is the county newspaper? Oh, uh, it's been the Derby Informer. I can't remember what it is uh, today. Does the newspaper provide that information free on their website? Um, I know that at one point they did. I'm not aware if they do that now. Would a city website suffice? That Do has been an that interesting is? question that has um, come up. I think there, uh, there's probably some more to explore there, but I think it comes into home rule and uh, what abilities the city has to opt out. I'm sorry, maybe you drip down worse. Maybe it's time to dismount. <laughs> but um, so if somebody doesn't have the means to be able to have access to purchase the Wichita Eagle on a daily basis or the Derby Informer or they, because you have to, and you can't just access it online for free, you also have to have a subscription. So what's, what's another alternative? Uh, well, uh, the other alternative would be to check out the MAPC agenda that gets posted. Um, we don't really have a, a great one that would tell you what the notification was in the paper, at least not yet. These are just questions that my dad asked me. Yeah, so. no, they're very good questions. 
Uh, the other uh, formats that we use as well is that we send out emails. Um, it, we also, there's the yard signs that uh, come up every so often and are required as part of an MAPC policy. And there are letters that are sent out, which we're going to spend uh, most of the time focusing on today. An additional resource I wanted to point out, I'm not going to go through an additional detail on it, but that's the website uh, for the planning department, and we're working every day to make that more robust. So, so in terms of the published notice, um, so the purpose, again, is to identify uh, for the public what are some of the cases or what are the cases that are going to be heard at the public hearing that's held at the Planning Commission. It's required by state statute and it must be published 20 days prior to that public hearing. And if, it, if that publication uh, doesn't happen or if there's uh, errors in the publication, we need to go back to start and we're not able to hear the case until that's taken place with that 20 days notice. Uh, the next one then is the emails. There are two ways that we send out emails. The first one is using a constant contact distribution list that folks can sign up for on the <coughs> planning department webpage. The second one is case specific. So if you come into the MAPC meeting and you sign up for notifications on a case, we will use that email address that you provided to send out updates on where that case is in the process. The signs, the signs have been a topic of conversation, again, going to emphasize the letters today, but um, this is an example of the sign. Uh, this is uh, intended to notify the general public. It's an MAPC policy. It is not required by the state, nor is it required by the zoning code. And uh, the duration, it should be posted at least 13 days prior to the public hearing. Uh, sometimes we hear from folks saying that one has blown down or that they didn't see one. Um, there's no specified enforcement action. It is up to the MAPC. They would have the option of deferring the item until uh, the applicant can provide evidence that it has been posted if they felt like that was necessary, but largely it's up to the MAPC. I'm, I'm going to ask another question because mm -hmm. almost every zone, not every zoning case, but if there's any kind of contention during the zoning case in District 2, my dad asked about signs. Yep. I think your staff knows that. Um, so the applicant is requ required, according to MAPC policy, to put the sign up, correct? That's correct. And then I know you said it, but if you could just repeat it and maybe elaborate a little bit, the question also for my district advisory board um, is let's say that, you know, Tuttle development doesn't put the sign up. Mm -hmm. Is there any kind of consequences? There is no specific consequence or enforcement action that is specified as part of the policy. However, the MAPC could have the, they would have the discretion to defer the item until the applicant provides evidence that the sign has been posted, such as in the way of a photo or some other kind of testimony to, to that effect. And I know the answer to this question, but I'm gonna ask it because I get asked significant times at death. So Tuttle Development is asking for rezoning. We're supposed to go and put, and there is no Tuttle of Development, right? <laughs> I'm just making this up. But let's say we don't, we, does somebody go check and see if we've put the sign out? Uh, n staff members, when they're in the area, will go and check, but that is not a guarantee that they'll get out there to do that. Um, if we receive complaints about it, we'll go, uh, sometimes we'll get out and check. Uh, really what we hear about is from the public who have gone out and said, look, I've gone and it's not there. And we hear that as part of the testimony. Yeah, and we do, not only from my district advisory board members, but if there, it's a contentious zoning case from the residents nearby, they'll often bring up that there wasn't a sign or the sign was there for you know two hours and it blew away and mm -hmm. yeah, so thank you. Sure. Has the MAPC ever taken an action because of that sign not being up or displayed properly? I think there have been, uh, I, I know and I've witnessed cases where there's been quite some deliberation about what to do, um, especially if folks are very passionate that the sign should be there. Um, I have not seen one that I can recall that has been kicked back or deferred because of that, but I know that there's been uh, multiple times when there's been some, uh, quite a bit of deliberation on that. Okay, so um, the notification letter. So this is required by Kansas statute. It's also required as, as part of the zoning code. For city cases, Kansas statute requires that it go out a minimum of 200 feet from the boundary of the application area. Now for county cases, they require that it go out 1,000 feet from the buffer. For the city of Wichita, the city of Wichita has um, some unique provisions in that this is again an MAPC policy 
that requires this, and it was also reviewed by the city commission at that time. It's so old that it was reviewed by not the city council, but the city commission. Um, and it varies from 200 feet to 1,000 feet, and it depends on the size of the application area. So here is the table that shows that. So you can see the minimum distance is in line with state statute at 200 feet, but as the property goes up in size and acreage, you can see it gets all the way up to 1,000 feet. Now, who is the letter sent to? Uh, the recipients that we send letters to are to property owners in notification areas, in the notification area, and that is, again, in compliance with Kansas statute. Uh, it's also sent as a courtesy to registered HOAs and registered neighborhood associations. And by registered, I mean those that have registered with the city of Wichita, and it's up to them to keep their contact information up to date. Mm -hmm. Scott, another quick question. I'm sorry, if you could go back. Sure. Just, again, I'm asking some questions I might know the answer to, but just to bring it to the public awareness. So when you say that HOAs are, it's their responsibility to register with the city, what office do they register that with? They would contact um, the, uh, it's, it's the folks who help out with the DABs, the city manager's office is who they would call and uh, contact one of the neighborhood assistants to get uh, Registered. And so, is, any, is anything ever sent out to the, to the homeowner association say, hey, it's you know, the end of the year, we have to contact info? Or? Uh, I'm not aware if there is. That's something I'd have to check in with Maddie about. Okay. Yeah. I would say that um, the main concern that I've heard from uh, my district advisory board is. Um, being concerned if the letter goes out in Spanish. That's mm, been yes. the, the main concern, in addition to how far it's going, but there's been a lot of concern that um, maybe some of the uh, residents in the area around some of the zoning cases might just toss it to the side and not know until after it's too late. So I don't know if that's still on you guys' radar, um, but if not, if we could continue to monitor that or find a way to somehow send them out in Spanish as well. You bet, I've got a, a note on that, so we'll follow up with that. Thank you. Now in terms of the addresses, so, um, so we've talked about who it goes to, but how do we get the addresses for that? Um, the applicants are responsible for purchasing a list, it must be a certified list from a title company, and there's a cost involved with that that the applicants pay. And uh, this is required as part of the planning department's application form for a zone change. A quick note about the notice and the protest area. So they are two different things. Uh, they are both created by state statute. So the protest area for city cases is 200 feet. That's required by state. That can, the results of uh, protest can change the vote by the governing body or the city council in that case. However, the notification area, it's a minimum of 200 feet, but the city has the ability to increase that, and uh, the results of that do not change the vote. So uh, two separate things, both referred to in state statute. Here's a, an example of a recent case where there was a significant difference in the notification area and the protest area. So the protest area is outlined in green, the notification area is outlined in orange, so you can see that it's significantly uh, larger than the protest area. So in the discussions with the MAPC advanced plans, uh, one of the things that we did was we looked at the state of uh, practice in other communities. And we looked at two things specifically. One is the distance, how far do they send them out? And number two is the recipients, who receives those notices? So uh, for cities in the state of Kansas, and again, this is not comprehensive, it's just a quick scan of what other communities are doing, you can see that the communities we contacted reported that uh, the overwhelming majority of them are doing the, what's uh, the minimum required by the state, which is 200 feet. Lawrence is the exception at 400 feet. We looked at cities outside the state of Kansas and saw uh, a variety of distances, but you can see that most of them are in the ballpark of 200 to 300 feet. There are some nuances, however, that I'd like to point out. Um, Kansas City, Missouri, you can see that they send it out 300 feet. They also send it to registered neighborhood associations and civic organizations, and that the addresses uh, come from the city's uh, information 
and uh, you can see notified 13 days prior to the hearing. Um, there are some ones in the ones in Oklahoma, Oklahoma City and Tulsa. They have a minimum number of property owners that need to be notified, and if that's not met with the minimum distance, they go out uh, further distances. Um, Des Moines what's, and sorry, Bloomf Scott, what's, do you know what the reasoning is behind the minimum of 15 property owners? I don't know. Uh -oh. Anyone ever offer that? Okay. Um, and then there are other communities like Des Moines and Broomfield, yeah, which random. it varies based on the type of application or the type of case that it is. And again, here are the distances uh, the city of Wichita notifies out to. In terms of recipients, so who receives those letters from the other communities, uh, generally all of them responded that they mailed the notices to the property owners. In terms of options and cost, again, looking, dividing this into recipients and uh, distances. So when we looked at recipients, uh, you know, there's, there's an option for no change, so just leave it the way that it is. There's the option to reduce the distribution but in this, uh, the city of Wichita is fairly constrained because state statute requires it goes out to the property owners. Um, there's also the possibility of increasing distribution. So you could send it to the property addresses, not just to the property owners. Uh, part of the question, one of the questions that comes up with this then is, well, how many people on average are notified? And it varies significantly from case to case. We've had some that have as few as eight properties that are notified. Uh, we've got some that had 400 plus. I think some of the recent cases in the Moorings area recently had like 400 plus properties that were notified. So it can vary significantly. So for that, in that case, um, you'll see that we use an example number. We don't give you an, an average. But in terms of cost, uh, if an applicant comes in, uh, we know that they're going to have paid $175 at, at a minimum for uh, the uh, ownership list the certified ownership list, and it's $18 for each property above 10 addresses. So um, it's quite expensive. It, it can be quite expensive if you get rather large notices. Yes? Do we have a ballpark estimate of how much is spent on this a year? Not yet. Um, that would be something that we've got to go through the records and uh, add up. I think an, an average maybe would be skewed by how large some of them are and how small they are, but uh, we could look at trying to get a median number so, okay. Yeah. yeah. Appreciate it. Sure. And then we've also um, calculated our cost uh, at approximately two dollars and sixty-four cents. I know that's really specific, but that's an approximate number of how much we spend uh, to send out each letter. So when we talk about um, the potential cost for sending it out to the property address, not just the property owner. Um, what we find is that there's one title company that does the majority of property ownership lists in for city applications. Uh, that, prop, that company does not provide the property address. They only provide you with the owner address, not the property. So we would have to have them do that as well. And that is an additional $2 charge for every record, for every property. And then for the planning department, it's again just $2.64. So if we use an example of 30 uh, cases or 30 properties that need to be notified, and we're in the blue boxes up at the top, uh, and we multiplied that by $2, we would expect to see a cost of about $60 additional cost for an applicant. Uh, similarly, if we look at an average, let's say ballpark of 20% of the properties and that 30 are uh, renters, so we would have six properties that we would notify at $2.64, an increased cost to the planning department of around 15, 16 bucks. So um, this is meant to give you an example, an illustration of how much it would cost to notify the properties, not just the property owners, so that therefore renters or someone who's living at the property that's not a property owner would receive notice. So we're gonna segue now into uh, transition into distances because there have been questions about what about a larger notification uh, area? So again, we've got um, no changes in option, just leave it the way that it is. You've got decrease the distances, but again, you can't go less than 200 feet because of state statute, um, or you can always increase the distance. Um, in one of the memos that you'll see, uh, there are three scenarios that we looked at. All of these properties are in the ECA, so it's a more of a traditional grid pattern that you're going to see um, 
And those properties are somewhat smaller. They're not as large as some of the properties that you may see in a more suburban context. But you'll see that property size does make a difference as some of them are slightly smaller, slightly bigger than others. So again, the cost, uh, potential cost that would be uh, uh, for this would be $18 per an additional property to get the record from the title company. Also the planning department, 264. So um, here's the table. So I think the most interesting part of this is we've got exhibit A, B, and C. Those are the three different kind of circle diagrams that you just saw. Uh, I think the most interesting part is the number of addresses at the different uh, distances. So we have 200 feet, 500 feet, and 1,000 feet uh, radius notification areas, hypothetically. The number of addresses, properties that would be notified for Exhibit A goes from 33 properties at 200 feet to 114 properties at 500 feet to 390 properties at 1,000 feet. And the reason why this is growing exponentially is because as you go further out, the area is increasing exponentially because you're not just going a straight distance, you're doing a circle all around the perimeter. Yeah. So can I ask a clarifying question on this? Sure. Math is not necessarily my forte. So for example, Riverside in Exhibit A, the number of addresses, right now it's 33 feet. If we went it to 1,000, 390, so that's 357 more addresses, correct? Yes. OK. So are you saying it for the applicant, it would be $18 more per address? $18 more per so address. So three fifty, for example, in this one example, times one eight, and that's six six thousand four hundred twenty nine more for the applicant that to send correct. it to the bigger That is area. correct. And then it would be the three hundred and fifty seven times the two dollars and sixty four cents for the MAPC. That is correct. So it's a it's it's a it's a it's a budget concern for sure. No, there are financial implications, yep. Okay, thank you. Sure. So that's, that's what this table essentially is showing you. Um, and you can see that there's some slight variations from property to property. The one at Woodlawn, Exhibit C, is the one that has larger properties. So you can see that it, the, the jump is perhaps less significant in the flat number of properties, but still as a percentage increase, still significant. So um, with that, we have gone through all four of these. Um, hopefully it's been helpful. Hopefully it's been, uh, answered some of the questions. And we've, I've gotten some great feedback and comments that I've taken note of to follow up with. Um, but with that, I'll stand for any questions. So I, I had a few. Um, yes, sir. I know I was the one pushing the 1,000 feet. Um, I appreciate this uh, table and showing the cost mm -hmm. of, um, to the applicant as well as the department. Uh, that really hasn't swayed me uh, from increasing the area. Uh, maybe if we backed off a thousand, I still would like to see an increased area because that's what we continue to, to mm -hmm. hear, or at least I continue to hear. So the 500 foot um, would make sense, and I, I think I would be okay with that. Other things that I've heard, and I think I've said to you, is um, some simplicity and wording on that letter that goes out on the notification. Uh, one of the neighborhoods in District 1, uh, around that club car wash said that when they got the letter, the way they interpreted it was that they should not protest because they weren't within 200 feet. And I know the letter doesn't say that, but if there was some way to simplify the wording to let folks know if they, if they like it, great. If they don't like it, they still can protest. And maybe specifically uh, what that means as far as where they are in that 200 foot to 500 foot area. And then if there was a way um, also, to Councilmember Ballard's point, uh, but a little more specific, if we could get multiple languages. So we know Spanish is probably the number two language here, but also I think Vietnamese is number three, and there may be, a, I don't know what the number four is, but if that was simplified to one page, maybe the front is English, the back is Spanish, and then the second page would be Vietnamese and another. And then I'm, I'm definitely supportive of residents as well as property owners, because the property owners, especially with our out-of-state folks who don't communicate back with the people in-state, it at least allows them an opportunity to know what's going on in their neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And personally, I think the, the bump in cost of 500 um, feet is less significant than 1,000, but still significant. But 
the rezonings that we may approve or not approve can impact the neighborhood for decades to come. And I think it is worth that, um, at least for folks to know what's going on. Thank you. Scott, I just have a comment and I have a question. Again, I think I know the answer, but just gonna bring it up and then a request if I can. So one of the questions that we, we always get um, from my district advisory board members and then also community members when we have contentious zoning cases is why does sometimes it goes to DAB first and why does sometimes does it go to MAPC first? Because I do feel like the order sometimes makes a difference, right? And so um, it, some of my district advisory members have expressed that they feel that it should be consistently one way. And, and my answer is always because of timing usually, yep. um, but, and I don't know if any other council members have this question brought up, but I think it's a difference, right? If they know that the MAPC has passed it, then a lot of times they're like, okay. So if you could maybe just, because I, I actually have some DAB members watching and <laughs> they're texting me <laughs> saying, ask this, ask that, which is great. I love the sure. community feedback. And then it, I'll let you address that, but then um, so I can give the mic back to Council Member Holheisel. Would you be willing to do this presentation at district advisory board meetings and just sure. to have some of this robust discussion? You know, we kind of get in our meetings and we plow through the zoning case and these come up, but it might be good. Uh, and I think my, my district advisory board would appreciate it just to kind of have the conversation all at one time. So a sure. question and a plea. Thank okay. you. Um, for number one, in terms of the, the sequence or the order of events, uh, it's challenging for staff. And the, the, the reason why is because the MAPC meetings happen generally twice a month. The DAB meetings happen once a month. And so unless we want to delay an application for you know three weeks, somewhere in that ballpark, uh, we're going to end up with a sequence sometimes where the MAPC goes first and then the DAB or, or whatever the, the preference is not, right? Um, so it's just a matter of sequencing and we've got a, um, that's certainly something that could be changed, but I would encourage you, we've got a, a PowerPoint presentation that staff can provide that uh, could be helpful for that one, for that specific uh, issue. And then the second one is, um, could we present this at DAB meetings? Absolutely, and I know for Council Member Johnson, I just wanna say we've uh, got a presentation that we wanna do for him about um, zoning in general, and I wanna acknowledge that I've got that request. <laughs> um, and then the second thing is, yeah, we can certainly add this along with those. Yeah. I think it would be helpful, especially when you see the monetary um, side of it something that I've thought about to that extent. And for my other council members, I've had Scott do the zoning 101 at my district advisory board and it was so helpful. So if you haven't taken Scott away from his family yet one more time on a Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday night, you might want to entertain the thought because it really does you know, we, we assume everybody knows what we know, and, and that's not necessarily the case, and we have these awesome community members who wanna be involved in our system and make great decisions, and so we just need to make sure we're giving them the tools and skills to be able to do that, so thank you. Yeah, Scott, you're really loved down at uh, District 3, District Advisory Board. Uh, we love it every time you're there. Um, I'd just like to <clears throat> say I, I, I agree with Council Member Johnson on the notification at a 500 foot radius. Also, um, not just the property owners, but the addresses, because many people have stakes in it. Um, I, I do have a question. Is there any way we could adjust it by zoning type as well? It seems yeah. like um, if it's moving towards like an industrial uh, zoning change, that seems to be a little more controversial than if it's a, a duplex going up in the middle of a neighborhood. So that, that might be something that we consider if we can I don't know if that yeah uh, we certainly can um, it's just a matter of uh, how much complexity and balance so it's certainly something that we can look into and also see uh, again what other communities are doing what conclusions they've uh, what what they conclusions they've come to in terms of what's a good fit okay and then um, the um, the protest zone is that something that 200 feet is a minimum, correct? So we can go larger than that if we want to? No, in talking with legal, I, I don't believe that we can. I think the state constrains that to be the 200 feet. And I think um, I think if you look at it there uh, from two different perspectives, one would be 
from the applicant's perspective of how many folks get to weigh in on this, and then the other would be from the residents and, and stakeholders in the area, how many folks get to weigh in on it. And so I think that the state has arrived at 200 feet, and that's that's what it's Regardless for. of the acreage or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, can I get something sent to me from legal on that? Oh. I'm, I'm yeah I'm over here oh sorry uh, yes yes it is set by state statute um, we can look to see if that can be expanded I, I think Scott's right that because the state limits that area that that's going to be what we're going to live with yeah. but I can certainly look at that do do you know off the top of your head what statute that is no <laughs> I can I can get you in the ballpark um, chapter 12 Chapter 12, probably in the 700s. Uh, so 757 is the one that uh, talks about the notification letter, so it's going to be within a few numbers of that one. Okay. That's all I had. Thank you. Yeah, I, I guess we'll look into that. I, I, I agree that informing other folks as well, even if they're not within 200 feet, is probably the most transparent way to go. I, I Perhaps it's a different type of postcard or different type of notification. I'm sure I mean, there is a First Amendment rights issue when it comes to limiting a city and our ability to communicate with, with folks. So maybe there is, in addition to the, the 200 feet, notifications stay, but also maybe there's a way that we can notify folks who are outside the petition area to this so that if there's any unforeseen issues, they, they can come up, they can come up. Uh, so perhaps we can take a look at that some more. And I, I would just reiterate just for anyone watching it, it's important to me because, you know, for example, you have a property owner who is responsible for a quarter of the evictions in Cedric County who may not care when they get a letter about something, but the folks who live there, they might. Or you might have a property owner that's hiding behind 12 shell companies, and we may be telling them what's going on, but the folks who live there care. That person may or may not get it or may not care what goes on here in Wichita. So I just think it's important that people know uh, who live in the area what's going on. Thank you, everyone. Great job. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. All right, so yeah, that's all we have. That's all we have. Yeah. All right, is there anything else for the discussion? See you tonight. Six o'clock. See y'all tonight, yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's six o'clock. And it was John.